Uh, welcome everyone uh, and good morning uh, our PCS members. Uh, welcome to our seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, today to have uh, Wen Wei Ho uh, uh, from Stanford University to tell us a bit about his work. Um, and I would like to invite uh, first our scientific host, uh, Sergei, to introduce our speaker. Yes, uh, okay, good morning everyone. and. Uh, Good evening to Van Wai, uh, and we are uh, from the future, as I like to say, <laughs> because we are in your tomorrow, uh, but you will soon be there as well, don't worry. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you with us, uh, and uh, uh, I enjoyed the recent talk of yours at, uh, at an online conference, and uh, given your, uh, the topic of the talk, but also uh, the research areas at our center, I thought it will be a great idea and to have you with us. And one of the good things about uh, the COVID time is that, and online uh, meetings is that, uh, despite the fact we cannot meet in person directly, uh, we can at least arrange things uh, rather quickly and unbureaucratically. So I'm, I'm glad it worked out. Let me say a few more words about our uh, speaker today. So in my uh, Ho uh, did his uh, undergrad at uh, Princeton University and then moved to the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Canada uh, to finish his uh, master there. Uh, and then he started a PhD uh, uh, program in, in the PhD program uh, at the University of Waterloo uh, with advisors Abanin and Vidal. And then uh, because of, uh, uh, because uh, Professor Abanin moved to uh, Geneva, Switzerland, um, uh, when I moved uh, with him and finished his PhD in 2015, uh, uh, no, sorry, in 2017 uh, at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Then he moved uh, to Harvard University to work uh, with uh, uh, Michael Lukin and Eugene Demmler. And since 2020, he uh, is a research fellow at, uh, the, at Stanford University uh, with uh, faculty sponsor Vedika Kemani, whom I guess a number of us also knows from previous meetings and her work. Right, uh, so uh, Wen Wei has uh, uh, quite an impressive uh, list of uh, publications which uh, focuses around quantum dynamics, condensed matter, quantum simulation, quantum information, uh, non-equilibrium, many-body uh, dynamics, and more. And uh, today he will speak to us uh, on pre-thermal phases of matter, time crystals, time quasi-crystals, uh, and and beyond. So uh, please, when I, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So good morning to everyone. And um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you to the organizers for giving me this chance to speak. I really appreciate it. Right, um, so today, what I would like to talk to you about is about some recent developments in many body physics, uh, basically how we can realize and define new phases of matter in out of equilibrium situations. So specifically, I'll talk about time crystals, time quasi crystals, but also things beyond that, that can be realized in something known as a pre-thermal or pre-thermalization regime in dynamics. So um, to, to begin, let me give um, an, a, you know, to contextualize the work in a bigger context, in a broader context. And also before, before I, I move on, I just wanna say, if you have any questions, please feel, to, feel free to interrupt and uh, let me know. And also if, I, if you need me to raise my voice, just let me know as well. Right, <clears throat> so um, the broader question we want to ask is this. So in, in condensed matter, what we're interested in is of course, understanding the collective behavior of many particles interacting quantum mechanically. Uh, this is known as a quantum many body problem. And we know we can get very interesting phases of matter defined with uh, emergence phenomena like magnetism, superconductivity, the quantum Hall effect, and so on and so, and, and so, on and so forth. Now, what really binds them all together is the fact that these are, these are universal in the sense that um, the emergent properties are not very, uh, they, they do not depend very strongly on the specific details of the, of the microscope, microscopic of the system. So you can change uh, some, some part of the system in, in, a, in a small way, and then the emergent properties will also smoothly deform until you really disrupt the system and then you undergo a phase transition. 
So by now we have quite a number of frameworks to understand them. Uh, so for example, we use the concept of symmetry breaking to understand magnetism and superconductivity. And more recently, we also have the concept of topology that can be used to classify topological, topologically ordered phases of matter. But one thing I want to mention is that what all of these phases have in common is that these are phases at equilibrium, or more specifically, thermal equilibrium. So we assume, or we implicitly assume that at the back of our minds, aside from the systems of interest that we're looking at, there's always a heat buff or heat reservoir by, uh, with which the system can exchange energy or particles with and eventually settle down to some steady state that is well-defined uh, with, some, with, with some thermodynamic quantities like temperature or pressure. And then from there, we can do our, our analysis. So, the, um, so in this case, for example, for a two-dimensional electron gas, you know, typically the, the heat bath might be the, the substrate that, that it lives on. You know, for, the, for the electrons in a metal, the, the phononic lattice forms the heat bath. And so all these are very natural concepts and natural things that we think of. All these phases are the equilibrium. So the question I want to pose here is, can we um, study the many body problem in out of equilibrium situations? Can we still define some sort of universal emergent features that appear in dynamics? And from there, can we you know, classify them and understand what's, uh, what, can we really define phases of matter from far from thermal equilibrium? in the sense that can we define a collective behavior that is robust and not dependent strongly on the microscopic details of the system. So the basic setup I, can, I want to consider is this, of, uh, which is isolated quantum many body systems undergoing unitary dynamics. And it's actually very simple. I just want to consider a collection of say, atoms, spins, qubits, what have you, you know, a many body system. And I want to consider in, a, in isolation that is without the heat buff. So this is one way of, of driving the system out of equilibrium or making sure that it's never in equilibrium. And then I can imagine that I begin from some simple inertial state. And by simple, I mean that the state is say factorizable, unentangled product state, say, and then dynamics is driven by some strongly interacting Hamiltonian H so that the inertial state is not near some equilibrium state of the Hamiltonian. And so we know in dynamics, it simply makes all the spins, you know, get messed uh, up, jump over. Interruption, Aveho. Yes. You said equilibrium state. Uh, what is that? Right. You said so, the initial uh, state is not an equilibrium state. What do you mean by equilibrium state? Yeah. So, for example, the Hamiltonian has equilibrium states, which is just given by the, say, the, the Gibbs ensemble of pretty much any function of the Hamiltonian. This state will not evolve in time. So, if you take, and typically, if you take I mean, a, the Hamiltonian a, has eigenstates, right? We know what yeah. that is. What is, a, what, is a, what is an equilibrium state? So, How do I make it? So for example, a mixed state of the entire system in say a definite temperature, okay. e to the power okay. minus beta h will be an equilibrium state. Okay. So I'm gonna stay far away from that and assume that the state is pure and is given by some uh, factorizable pattern. And we know that in time, the, the dynamics of the Hamiltonian is going to mess up the spins and create entanglement and so on. And, but okay. you know, like describing it is very simple. All we, we know that all we have to do is you know, uh, apply the unitary time evolution operator to it. But this is, um, so of course, this law is very simple, but what we're looking out for is a bit uh, deeper than that, which is, is there something universal that happens? Specifically, if you look at a local sub-region of the full system, so for example, here I'm looking at region A, and I'm gonna call the rest of the system B. So by looking at, at the local sub-region, I can look at the reduced density matrix, which is tracing out the global wave function over the, 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 the degrees B. And I'm going to ask, what's the late time behavior of this reduced density matrix in time? So, and, and because the reduced density matrix can be equally well reconstructed, like tomographically from observations of observables in A, like whatever makes up A, then this is equivalent to the question, what's the late time limit of a local observable with um, support in A? So here, what I mean is that O of A is, you know, in probing only properties of A, and mu just represents whatever basis, uh, the, the entire basis of operators that live in A. And at this point, one of the, uh, some of you might ask, wait, hang on, this is a pretty idealized situation. Uh, which quantum system, quantum many body system doesn't have a bath to it? So this seems pretty academic and idealized and you know, why should we study it? Well, previously I mentioned that much of our understanding of phases of matter begin from thermal equilibrium. You know, we assume that something was already at some finite temp uh, definite temperature. But 
there's a question that why, like, how does it happen in dynamics? You know, we, why, why did we assume that from the beginning? Uh, surely the system must have, you know, gone towards a thermal equilibrium beginning from something out of equilibrium. And moreover, we can, we can model the bath and the system as one entire big quantum system, which is isolated. And so then the question becomes, um, why, why are we justified in assuming that the system that we are studying is at, becomes, uh, is at equilibrium um, at late times? Or in other words, what's the justification for the emergence of statistical mechanics? So this happens to be a very fundamental, fundamental question at, the, at its very core. And I, I should also mention that this question, even though it's very simple to state, is of interest to the um, to very different communities besides condensed matter, like high energy and quantum information communities. Um, one example would be the, the black hole information paradox, which uh, I can tell you more about, but basically they are also interested in understanding how a black hole, which is a closed quantum many body system can scramble information and give rise to something universal like universal Hawking radiation. Okay, so there's another good reason why we are studying this problems right now. And, and in fact, I should mention that this question is very topical. Uh, many people are studying this. And much of the reason is because of this, um, this uh, advances that have been made experimentally in creating systems which realize this isolated quantum many body scenario. And so there's a lot of progress in the AMO communities in building uh, large scale quantum systems comprised of basic building blocks like cold atoms, trapped ions, superconducting qubits, solid state defects, uh, neutral ribbon atoms trapped in op optical tweezers. All of these go under the guise of quantum simulators. And the key features they have is that they are very well isolated. They, they do not you know, interact very much with the environment. They are large scale, so we can probe many body physics. And furthermore, they are controllable. So we can really drive the system out of equilibrium or prepare a state which is non-equilibrium. And this allows us to explore the non-equilibrium quantum many body frontier. Uh, and by there's a question from uh, Dominic, Dominic, please uh, unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, could we go to the previous slide, please? Yes, yes. So you mentioned that, uh, you know, this kind of a red box thing, this limit exists, but it seems to me that this is exact formulation of something which is called eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which goes back to 1993, I think, by George Deutsch. And the 1940s Rednitsky. So I'm a little confused about these, uh, you know, PRL and PRE that you are mentioning because this is just much older than that. Um, okay, so let me make a few comments. There's a difference yeah. between equilibration, equilibration and thermalization. Equilibration is just the fact that the limit exists. And thermalization is the fact that the limit exists and tends towards something given by a, a Gibbs ensemble. So it, th thermalization is a much stronger statement. Um, this works, you know, described that equilibration does exist if you assume that the system is many body enough and the, and the energy levels are generic enough that there's no, uh, you know, uh, some conspiracy in the energy levels. The, the, the energy levels are, are, are incommensurate enough with, with one another so that there's the phasing and over time this does tend towards some steady state limit. Now, the, the, the statement you raised about ETH, which is eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, as the name suggests, is just a hypothesis and it doesn't hold in many cases. Furthermore, it's not a proven statement, so you cannot prove it. In, in fact, we know of cases where this is false. So um, what, what I'm trying to say is that Shretniki and Deutsch in the 19, 1990s came up with the idea of eigenstate thermalization hypothesis to maybe give a handle for why Thermalization exists uh, happens in a in a closed quantum many body system, but it was only in the uh, late two thousands that people uh, provably mathematically you know worked on that question of actually does this limit exist and is this equi uh, equilibration something that appears in a closed many body system? Mm. Does that answer the question? So, so essentially, ETH is not a provable statement. In fact, it's also not true. Yeah, but, but then you said, oh, these people proved it. So they obviously had some assumptions. But uh, just to clarify, like uh, Deutsch and Selnitsky also had some assumptions under which, uh, well, I'm not sure if they actually proved it, right? So maybe that's, that's the difference. No, so but there's some the things very reasonable, and they, uh, they used the connection with the random matrix theory, right? Exactly, as as, as, as the, I guess my point is that, as the name suggests, it's really just a hypothesis. 
it's not right. something that they prove. So, so, so what are the exact assumptions, or can you maybe talk about assumptions when they proved it, this Riemann and Linden? Yeah, so um, I believe that the one of the assumptions was that you know you have to look at a local subregion so that and the rest of the system is large enough, and basically you have to send the rest of the system to uh, you know the thermodynamic limit, right. and that makes a lot of sense because you want a lot of energy levels. And then you uh, make the assumption that the energy levels are, um, I, I guess, what's the word for it? They are mutually incommensurate enough that there, there are no accidental degeneracies. So that if you look at the, um, you, you know, you can always decompose this in the eigen basis of the Hamiltonian. And what you need right. is that there's dephasing. So you need the statement of dephasing coming about from having no accidental degeneracies in energy levels. And then in that case, it's really a statement that this Hilbert space is is dominated by the rest of the system. And so observables would just tend towards some equilibrium value. Right. But I stress again that, 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 this, the, that, that the value that it tends towards need not be the thermal value. And the O can be absolutely anything? Because I know with in this ETH, you can always find a O that uh, doesn't satisfy it. You know, it's, you can construct it. Um, so, so I have been very careful here and I've stated that this is a local subregion. So of course, you know, this, and you've made a very good point. If you take O to be, say, the projector onto, uh, I don't know, the eigenstate or, or two eigenstates, let's say, like N, bra N and, and cat M, where N and M are, are energy eigenvalues, then this, of course, does not have a limit. But what's really important is that you take O to only be supported in some finite region in space, and then you take the rest of the system to become thermodynamically large. Right, and but... That, but you say it holds for any local O or just some local or, or most of local O's apart from measure zero or something like that? So I believe that in this formulation, it holds for pretty much any um, local O, as long as the so region pretty A Pretty much. Is... Okay, sorry, sorry, more precise, any O, any O that is... Okay. The region is, is, is not growing in size. So the rest of the system is growing in, in, in uh, size, but region A is fixed in size. Okay, thank you. I'll take a look at those references. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Okay, so um, all right. So as as Dominic mentioned, so um, one okay. So what's the, one of the answers to one of the, to the question? What happens at late times to to the the local density matrix, the reduced density matrix of a sort re region? Equivalently, what's the observable going to? So one uh, intuition that we might have is that because this system is so small. You know, we can treat the rest of the system as a heat buff, even though in actuality, the entire system is in isolation. So there is no heat buff, but because the rest of the system is, has so many energy eigen levels, uh, um, so it can effectively serve as, as its own heat buff and cause region A to thermalize. And this leads to a very strong statement, which I, you know, it comes in many forms. ETH is one form, but I, I will not mention ETH in this talk. Uh, basically, the statement from StatMac is that the limit rho of A is universal, and it doesn't really depend on how you prepare the state, you know, um, microscopically. It only depends on global properties of it, of the initial state, like the um, whatever globally conserved quantities, example, energy or particle number. And and the key assumption here is that we assume that dynamics, you know, is agotic within within the um, region A. And it would explore all the allowed phase space and basically maximize its local entropy subject to all the conservation laws. So here, what I mean by local entropy is the entanglement entropy of the subsystem A. So I stress uh, again that, yeah. that this, this is an assumption. You know, this is an intuition and this cannot be proven. So this is something that we can just simply postulate and then we can check afterwards. Then yeah. by question, uh, so uh, when you say that A explorer subsystem A explores its allowed phase space, it is because it is interacting with B, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So yeah. here I'm thinking of it strongly right. interacting with B. Right. And then I just want to uh, get back to these old ways of uh, uh, introduce statistical mechanics, uh, which is a standard way to derive a Gibbs distribution for a system taking a a microcanonical system cutting a big, uh, an infinite maybe one, and then cutting a subpart out of it, and then looking at the fluctuations, and then uh, coming up with uh, what we know becomes the foundation of statistical mechanics. Of course, under some assumptions. Right. So, yeah. what is different here uh, from from these textbook approaches, which you would like to add uh, when we talk about the systems uh, you are interested in? 
is it that they are smaller than uh, finite and and Gibbs and Co didn't consider that and uh, or what 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 are the right so it has has a, has a discrete uh, a spectrum and and uh, Gibbs and Co assume continuous spectra or what uh, at, at what point do we get into new fields here right so so I would say that this is actually an assumption that that the fact that um, system like this statement a works for all its free and maximize a lot of phase space and maximize local entropy is, is a very reasonable statement because we are, we are dealing with the idea of like just you know throw your hands up in the air and say everything is lost except for anything globally conserved and, and that's a very reasonable assumption but um, in, in some cases that we have found in the past few years that this is actually not true that there can be quantum systems that violate this uh, but can my talk be, would, would not talk about but can there be also maybe non-quantum systems which also violate uh... Or not? The, right, th th that's a good question. I mean, uh, can there be, say, for example, many body localization in a classical chain of, of spins, for example? I think there are some works out there, but I'm not too familiar with them. Yeah, so it, it's a good question. But in, in my talk, I, I will touch upon uh, briefly the uh, some of the uh, ways in which we can go outside outside of this regime. But actually, during my talk, I'll talk about how we can stay within this regime and nevertheless find interesting physics because of a separation of time scales. Thank you. Okay. okay. Right. So um, I was mentioning that this is strongly an assumption. And let me just present for the outright that this cannot be proven. You know, uh, well, if you can prove it, then that'd be great. But I'm saying that people have tried it and this is not proven. And what they can do is they, become, they can come up with hypothesis like ETH to try to give an explanation for why this happens. Uh, ETH is the idea that the eigenstates of the system are actually already thermal to begin with, and, and this leads to predictions like, you know, this would happen, uh, thermalization would happen in dynamics, but this is a strong assumption. So one thing we, you, could, you could do to, to make a prediction from this idea, uh, and I would just briefly run through some semi-calculation, it's not really a calculation, is that suppose energy E is the only globally conserved quantity, then um, we can compute E, from what the um, initial state has, you know, uh, from the initial energy of the state, and from there compute an effective temperature beta or inverse temperature beta from assuming that the system somehow reaches an equilibrium state. So I'm saying that we just simply postulate this form and from there extract what beta is. And then we can use the same beta and the same ensemble to compute what the um, value of a local observable will be if it were in this ensemble. And it turns out that in, in many um, numerical simulations of microscopic models done in the past, which I do not present here, but I just present a cartoon sketch of it, that in fact, this uh, predicts the late-time plateau of a local observable in finite size numerics, you know, spin chains of 22, 24, so on and so forth in the bose hubbard model, for example. Um, so this seems quite reasonable and and uh, it's one paradigm that we are familiar with, and in fact, is universal because it doesn't care about what the initial initial state is; only cares about what the uh, global properties of the state are. Now, I mentioned that um, it maximizes the local entropy, and in this case, the local entropy is the entanglement entropy. And so, what would happen is that fundamentally, uh, the reason why the system can thermalize locally, even though the entire wave function still remains pure, because if you recall, this is, is an isolated system and isolated, isolated systems evolve unitarily, which means that pure state remains pure state. So globally, there is no entanglement, that there is no entropy generated, but locally there can be entropy generated and the key reason is entanglement. And this has been probed uh, experimentally. Uh, I will not describe the system, but basically Marcus Griner's group in Harvard, they looked at the bose harvard model and looked at thermalization. So essentially they looked at say six bosons, six sites uh, and you know, panel D shows that if you look at the entire wave function, the en entanglement does not grow, which means that the pure state remains pure. But if you look at a subregion, it, it, it grows and then saturates to what you expect it to be. And furthermore, local observables also thermalize according to what you expect it to be. So the key message here is that entanglement is the cause for thermalization in an isolated many body system. Okay, I should also mention, uh, well, some. The natural question to ask is, how do we go beyond the paradigm of thermalization? So one way to break the assumption of ergodicity and exploring all the phase space is that we have a system which is exactly solvable, integrable, 
and examples are three fermions, or so say the better answered solvable XXC spin chains, which holds an extensive, extensive number of conserved quantities. So we don't expect normalization to happen there. More recently, we, have, uh, we know that if we have a very, very heavily disordered system, which is interacting, nevertheless, um, it manages to stay localized because we know that, that in the non-interacting limit, there's Anderson localization. So here, even if you do turn on some interaction, you can get many, a many body version of it. And in this case, this phase is characterized by emergent robust conserved quantities, which break the assumptions of StatMac. And therefore, this is one answer to the question I posed. And it is a novel dynamic of phase. And by phase, I mean it's robust against perturbation because you can make small modifications, mod modifications to this. And this phenomenology does not really change. And most recently, we also have um, uncovered perhaps uh, certain fringe cases like quantum many body scars, where um, it turns out that the, that the majority of the system is thermalizing, but you can find some initial special states which somehow persistently oscillate between themselves, which were first seen in experiments of Rydberg atoms. So they are all very interesting in their own right, but this is not the focus of my talk. And my talk is really just asking about thermalization. So if we, even if we accept the fate of thermalization, can there still be something interesting happening in the interim? So um, schematically, in a, in a very cartoon manner, I can denote how the system evolves through some phase-based plot like this. I imagine that you know, this manifold is some phase-based uh, manifold and the initial state lies somewhere. And eventually it wants to go towards some thermal fixed point with some um, temperature set by the global conserved quantity. So if there were more conserved quantities, then you would get more Lagrange multipliers, for example. But StatMac says something about where it ends up in, but it says nothing about the time scales on, where this on which this happens. In particular, could there be interesting transient but long-lived behavior, like the, the emergence of a non-equilibrium fixed point where the system evolves to, gets attracted to, hangs up for a long time before eventually leaving and ending up to what you expect it to be? So, um, to, Actually, we, we, we do know of some scenarios where this happens. So consider a Hamiltonian H with a symmetry G, and suppose that Hamiltonian has a part of the spectrum uh, in, in an equilibrium state, which spontaneously breaks the symmetry or does not. So a key example that you, you can have in mind is like the Ising model, uh, say quantum Ising model in 2D or 3D, or even just a classical Ising model. So we know that you know, below some uh, critical temperature, you have spontaneous symmetry breaking where the system has two different symmetry wells where, and above that the system only has one, one gigantic well. And, and so in this case, thermalization depends strongly on which part of the spectrum you are living in. Specifically, if you consider an initial state, then the initial energy of the state, uh, the, the energy of the state which is conserved will crucially determine how uh, local observables will behave. So from here, once again, you can compute what the effective temperature beta would be if you assume this relation. And if beta happens to be on this side of the phase, of the phase diagram, then we can say, we can say that you know, the system should basically explore all phase space and add up to your, your expected thermal fixed point. Conversely, if the temperature is low enough or if the energy is low enough and you end up in the, in the spontaneous symmetry breaking sector, then the system would evolve and, and go towards one of the, of the two symmetry broken wells for a long time before e eventually evolving out of, of this, before eventually tunneling between the two wells and smearing out over both wells and basically ending up in the, in the thermal fixed point. And- um, uh, how, how, Wenwei, both, uh, how, sorry, uh, yeah. Dominic has a question. Dominic, please. Yeah, uh, so you keep talking about phase space, but really what you are doing is Hilbert space, right? Yes. Um, so I. I I, let me just mention that this is a cartoon and, and you should take it uh, with a grain of salt. This is, I'm not trying to make the formal mathematical uh, connection between Hilbert space and phase space here. Uh, right. Um, yeah, I wonder about the, this uh, conserved quantities, right? Because the global energy is conserved. So first of all, you are not exploring the entire Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. um, even you say so, uh, yeah, like you ex explore that thing. <clears throat> you just don't, uh, there's the energy that's conserved quantity, right? So then the question is, uh, what is the role of the initial state in, in, in um, where, where the state goes, right? Because that really, 
given what you have initially, that uh, these these uh, these fixed points can be very different, right? Is it true? Um, no. So basically, um, the fixed points are not very different because here you have two symmetry broken broken wells, and so so the the initial state in this case. Um, the, how much weight they have in each symmetry well will determine how close you end up to each one of them. Um, okay, so let me put it another way. If you take an initial state which is simple and factorizable, right? So you can of course decompose it into the energy energy eigen uh, states, right? And it will have some mean energy, and there'll be some spread in the energy. So basically, what what um, part of the spectrum it has most it has overlap with determines what its late time behavior is. So you, you can also think of this axis. So here I've drawn for you temperature, but you should also think of this also as energy. And instead of energy, you should think of it as energy levels of the, of the quantum Hamiltonian. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm using two concepts in this, in this diagram here. So um, if the quantum Hamiltonian has an equilibrium state that has Spontaneous, spontaneous symmetry breaking or not. Correspondingly, in terms of the energy eigenvalues, uh, energy eigenstates, it means that this part of the spectrum will be, for example, paired or not paired, depending on whether or not it breaks the symmetry, right? And then the overlap of the initial state onto the energy eigenstates will determine what the late time behavior of, this, this, the, of a local subregion would be. Is the initial state here the, the global one or the local one? Global one, global one. But, but then if the initial state is energy against it, it just doesn't change, right? So it cannot converge to the thermal fixed point. So you need exactly, to stick exactly. yourself right. to some initial states that are kind of mixed in the energy eigen basis. Correct. So we, we are looking in a class of physical states. And, and if you ask me to give a definition of what, of what physical is, so I guess the, the, the most um, straightforward, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, the working definition would, would be to take a state which is factorizable and unentangled. So by far and large, such a state, if your system is strongly interacting, would not be an eigenstate. And in fact, you can show that it has a decomposition over a large number of eigenstates because its variance typically is like square root of n. So it will have it will, it will be like a it will be like a Gaussian. Basically it's its local density of states will be like a Gaussian with width square root of n. Right, so unentangled meaning through some partition or any partition, I guess it doesn't matter that much, right? But I think the point is that uh, the local Hamiltonians do not really commute with the global Hamiltonians, which makes the evolution, you know, these kind of uh, phases incommensurate, right? And then... Right, so I think the major is. point is that we, here we're always looking at a system that has a local Hilbert space structure. I'm, I'm always mm -hmm. going to keep this in mind that I'm going to, for example, looking at quantum spin systems, where there is you know, a C2 attached to each site and there are tensor products, all of them. And there is some graph structure which tells me what the Manhattan distance between each site is. This is very crucially important. So if I look at a state, so my class of initial states would be those that are say one spin pointing somewhere in the block sphere, another spin pointing somewhere in the block sphere and so on. And this class of states would be unentangled, simple to prepare in a, in a lab. Right. I, I don't states are not preferable in a lab you know, gen generically. Okay. So, so I guess the, the correct statement would be for some class of initial states that are just uh, product states uh, in the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it, it will explore part of the Hilbert space and it will, will converge somewhat to some fixed points, but still that very exactly it will go will depend on the coefficients, right? But not maybe too much. Well, uh, you'd be a bit careful here because you see, if you take an initial state which is pure and you ask which part of the Hilbert space does it explore, its, it's weight in the Hilbert space doesn't change over time because it's, it's it, which part of like the overlap with the eigen basis doesn't change over time. So, yeah, this, exactly. This, that was, but that was exactly my point too, because when you said, oh, it explores all phase space. It's like no, no, I, I say explore all phase space when restricted to a, lo a local subregion. So, you, you think of an effective description of this. Oh, yeah. That, that's actually probably true, yeah. Mm. Yeah, think of, a lo of the local Hilbert space then, and you ask which part of the local Hilbert space of A does it explore? And, and this is a statement in StatMac that it, it would you know, typically explore all the, all the Hilbert space of A. Well, so-so. There is still the global co conserved quantities. Up to the global conserved quantities, that, but, uh, Exactly. 
So, um, so that, that's yeah, more I'm... or less it will explore most of it, I think. Precisely. It'll be dense, probably. Yeah. Pre precisely, yeah. So it's, it's never to do with the global, global state, but to do with the local state. And importantly, when I write down this thermal fixed point, it seems as though I'm writing it down for the global system. But what I really mean is that you should evaluate it in the local observables for this to make sense. If oh, you wait, want but then you said this initial state is global peer state, so. Yeah, no. yeah. But you should evaluate the local basis? No, no, no. So, so the um, initial state is, of course, defined over the whole system. But whenever I do a measurement, I only want to probe local subregions. Oh, so uh, the observable acts as if the mean values, uh, if you take the, the mean values of the local base uh, of the local state, okay. mean values of local observables, then the state acts as a as a thermogenic state, right? It doesn't exactly. matter whether you take the pure state or the mixed. At, at late times, at late times, because of the entire right. growth. So this proportion is really uh, like in terms of lo uh, observing local observables. Right? It's not on the level of the state itself. It's more like exactly, exactly. So th okay. this statement is definitely not true at the level of the global wave, wave function, but it's only true if you evaluate it in a class once again of local obse obse observables, and and very and more specifically, we're looking at um, region A, which doesn't grow in system size and B, which grows in system size. Essentially, when, when we ask this question, we have to think, we, we, we have to take the thermodynamic limit B first before we take uh, time to infinity. So the, the correct order of limits is to fix a region oh, A nice. of finite size, let the system grow in, in, uh, to be as large as you want, I mean, uh, to, to add infinitum, and then ask what the behavior is, of region A is in the time domain as time goes to infinity. That's the only sensible way in asking this question. Sensible in the sense that it will give you the answer that you want. Sensible in the sense that it has a limit. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, because if you take a finite size system, everything oscillates, right? Exactly, so yeah, so that, that's the problem, theory. right? Right. You cannot Therefore, say anything about finite Right, system. so what, what saves the day is thermodynamic limit. Mm. Okay, so... Um, Okay, sorry about taking your time. Uh, no, no, it's okay. My, my introduction is very long now, but it's good. Everyone's on a, hopefully on the same page right now. Um, right, so once again, when I say a thermal fixed point, this is not the global wave function, but the fact that if you evaluate it in local observables, region A, uh, then it will agree. You know, the late time observables will agree with what you expect it to be here. But, um, and I was mentioning that in a symmetry broken Hamiltonian, the system can actually hang out in one of the symmetry broken sectors for a long time uh, before actually uh, exploring all possible uh, phase space you know, locally. And what this translates to is that if, say, I'm measuring the, the magnetization, which is the order parameter of, of the symmetry wells, if my temperature is low enough, then I will see a plateau in my magnetization for a long time. You know, and by long, I mean exponentially in a volume because this is a time that it takes a tunnel between the, the barriers. And whereas if my temperature is high enough, then it relaxes very quickly. Okay, and the weight, the height of this plateau depends on the weight of the initial state in the different symmetry broken sectors. So this is the cartoon picture that one you have. So this talk is really about pre-thermalization, uh, which is about trying, to, to, is about uh, describing systems in which you do have the appearance of non-equilibrium pre-thermal fixed points en route to actual thermal equilibrium. And I will argue that this, this uh, systems, uh, causal systems will exhibit these thermal fixed points and the system will, will, will uh, hang out around them for a long time, even exhibit many weird behavior uh, before it, it actually does eventually thermalize. And there are three classes of systems that I'll talk about. Each one of them um, has the, the feature that there's some large energy scale in the system, new, which basically sets a time scale of um, separation of time scales in the systems. So one is high frequency driven, periodically driven flow case systems. Another is high frequency quasi periodically driven systems. And the third is actually not in high frequency, but low frequency flow case systems. But there's a term in the Hamiltonian with a large coupling to a U1 charge. Okay, so this is a bit cryptic right now and I'll explain it once I get there. But essentially I would just wanna explain one notation which is big omega notation. So usually um, I guess 
everyone's familiar with big O notation, which is the upper bound. What I'm trying to say here is that the time scale in which it hangs out around there is lower bounded by any polynomial in nu. Nu is a large energy scale in the system. So basically, um, this could be uh, faster than any, any polynomial in, in nu. OK. So let me zoom into to the, uh, to the class of systems that I'll talk about next, high frequency driven systems. And in fact, th these two classes can be talked about on equal footing. So this is a class where I'm looking at a continually driven system. And once again, it is isolated. So it's not an open system. But because the Hamiltonian is now time dependent, I need to invoke a time dependent unitary, uh, well, a uh, time ordered unitary, which is given by this. And the, the two classes I'm interested in, for K and quasi-periodic, with, say, M tones. So in for K, uh, this for K Hamiltonian means that it repeats itself over time with, with period big T. Equivalently, you can decompose it in terms of the Fourier modes, and then uh, omega sets the frequency 2 pi over T. And the quasi-periodic drive is really a generalization of the idea of a for K, but now with M um, fundamental tones. So I promote omega to become a vector of omegas, and I'm going to choose it to be irrational, uh, mutually irrational. Uh, there are more technical terms like rational, rational dependent, independence to this. But basically, I treat each frequency as independent, and then uh, the Fourier modes will be over the uh, zm instead of z. OK, so this is a class of systems. So the first question one could ask is, if I am looking at this class of systems, what's the late time behavior of such a system if I look locally? And before I move on, I could mention that why consider this class? Um, many people have considered Floquet and driven uh, systems because they can give rise to uh, new, you can use them to engineer new interactions. Uh, you, know, you can get Floquet SPTs and so on. So all, all these are very interesting from the engineering point of view. But what I'd like to talk about is the thermodynamic properties of such systems, uh, the, the thermal equilibrium properties of such systems. Now, what's the fate of a driven many body system? So according to thermal uh, set MAC, what happens is that a, the system does not have any, any more energy conservation because it's being driven. It has lost the time translation symmetry. And so the system can absorb or emit drive quanta. Here I'm, I've, driven, uh, I've, I've written omega 1 and omega 2 for the, the different uh, drive quanta. And what this means is that locally, uh, the system should basically explore all phase, phase space locally with no global conservation laws because there's no energy conservation. So at late times, we expect that it should tend towards what is known as an infinite temperature fixed point or a maximally, maximally mixed state. So if you look at a, at a local observable, it will always be featureless in a late time limit. And this does not bode so well if you're thinking of doing for K engineering. So thankfully, there are regimes in which this does not happen immediately. And, and that's the whole point. So the first message I want to give is that heating is actually very slow at high frequencies. So what's a high frequency driven system? So let's focus on flow K for now. This is a system in which the drive quanta omega, you know, the, the, the rate at which you're shaking it, is very large compared to any other local scales in the system, like J, which I'm going to call um, any local interactions, any Z1 fields in the system. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to group them as J. The crucial point is that I'm going to assume that the interactions in these systems are local. They only affect neighboring spins or maybe three spins at once, but never like super long range interactions. And the energy hierarchy is that omega is much larger than J. So why is this so? Why is heating so slow in the systems? Well, let's, let's look at this case when I'm you know, imagining that I'm beginning a system from one energy eigenstate and I'm asking, how does it move in energy space under this drive? Well, the system can, can absorb or emit photons of uh, energy omega. So it can move here, or it can move here, or it can absorb you know, two omega if it wanted to. But the point is that omega is very large compared to a local reconfiguration of the state. So if you apply the Hamiltonian once, J, it only moves it, it only rearranges the system in a local manner and this only changes the energy by j and so you need you know many many local rearrangements to effect a, a resonance so um, basically the number of local moves is omega over j and this is a very high order process and this leads to, to an exponentially suppressed heating rate 
uh, which was proven you know, by, by these gentlemen in, in this PRL. Now, this is very schematic and to give you a sense of um, something a bit more rigorous, in fact, this is a rigorous you know, kind of uh, linear response proof of it. Consider the case of Fermi's golden rule, where I'm going to imagine that you know, I'm driving weekly with V of T and there's some time independent Hamiltonian. And I'm asking for transitions between eigenstates of H0, between eigenstates N and M. So as we all know, this is just simply affected by uh, the drive V, then you just have to compute the square of the matrix elements, and then there's some energy conservation term here. Schematically, I've drawn for you the, a many-body system, and V is assumed to be a many-body operator that acts locally. So in particular, it has one term that acts on one, one site or few sites at most. So here I've drawn it for one site. Here's a trick. You can insert, you know, in this expression, the commutator of H in the expression, and pull out omega square in the denominator. Why can you do this? Because of the energy conservation delta function. You can easily see that H acting on N gives you En, H acting on M gives you Em, and the difference needs to be omega, so this is an equality, this is the same. But what's crucial about this, uh, what, what, what's, what, what do you gain from this expression is that now you, you seem to have reduced the, uh, the quantity by this large factor omega square. And you can repeat this process and insert as many times as you want the commutator of h with phi. And so let's say you, you do it up to p times, you, know, you insert p, comm p commutators of h in, the, in this expression. And you seem to have gained a, a very uh, large suppression factor of omega to the power of 2p. And it seems like you can do it at infinitum. But the crucial point is this. You also need to understand how large this process or the, the number of terms is. So here, um, as you increase the number of commutators, you start from v, you start from v, and then the first commutator basically only has, uh, will only have terms uh, because the Hamiltonian is assumed to be a sum of local terms. So it only has terms that touch this operator v. So it grows by this amount. And then as you keep going, it also grows by this amount. But basically the number of terms that arise in this, this expression um, will become pretty large and you can estimate how large it becomes. And because of locality, you can estimate that it becomes, it grows as uh, some local energy scale to the power of p and p factorial. p factorial basically counts the combinatorial factor of how many times you can apply this commutator. And so th this is what kills you. you. You cannot do this at infinitum because if you could push p to infinity, it would mean that the heating rate is zero, which is not true. So therefore, the expression is this, that the heating rate is um, some small factor raised to the power of 2p, and p factorial will eventually dominate as p becomes large. And what we can do is that we can minimize over p to find the, the optimal heating rate, which sets a bound on how fast the system can heat up. And if we, indeed, if we do this minimization, we get that this is an, an exponentially suppressed heating rate. OK, so um, are there any questions at this stage? Yeah, let me, let me ask. Um, so I, I assume that if you have long range uh, interactions, uh, all this uh, exponential suppression is gone. What is it then replaced by? I mean, there should be still some, uh, I, I would expect some, uh, some kind of uh, suppression of, of the heating rate uh, in the limit of infinitely fast, uh, uh, infinitely large frequencies, similar sure. to this standard slow fast uh, variable separation in, in driven systems where the slow variables stop to respond to the fast variables if they are too fast, so to say. Indeed, or, yeah. So there have been works that go beyond this. Of course, this is quite a, a, an old work. And for long range systems, you can imagine that there's some power law decay, and then you can, uh, you can do the, the combinatorial trick again, and you can optimize it, and you can find a different decay. So in, this, in, in those cases, I believe that um, you know, if, if it's exponentially decaying, you will still get an exponentially suppressed heating rate. If it's power law decaying, I think it becomes, uh, I think it becomes power law decaying in the heating rate then. Okay, so I think I should speed up because I'm really, you know, uh, short on time, but um, let me say that, okay, so the, the key point here is that heating is slow at, at uh, high frequencies. And the same uh, logic also applies to quasi-periodically driven systems, even if we do drive it with M-tones. 
So here, what high frequency means is that we need omega one to omega m to be much larger than energy, any local energy scales. And similarly, we can ask the question, how fast does it heat up? And it turns out that, um, well, now energy can be absorbed or emitted in, in linear combinations of the drive quanta, which is you know, n1 omega one plus nm omega m and so on. So this can be large like before, because you know, if omega one is large, then this is a very large quanta, but it can also be made arbitrarily small because you can always find an n where you know, um, the energy difference becomes small because I presume that omegas are incommensurate. So there's always a possibility of finding a small resonance, you know, a, 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 sorry, a large resonance because of, of a small gap. So for here, I've denoted, for example, a process where I've absorbed two omega ones and three omega twos and end up with just a very small energy difference. So this in principle can be bad. But once again, um, so how, how, how do we resolve the, the, the situation? Well, if the energy difference is large, then we still have the suppression factor from before, locality saves the day. But this factor, this suppression factor becomes uh, not very powerful or it becomes ineffective if the energy difference becomes small. So we need a few more mechanisms. And there are two mechanisms. So one, we need to control how fast this you know, energy gaps become small as a function of n. As you increase the, 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 the number of photons that you absorb or emit, how small can these resonances be? And this is what is known as a Diophantine condition on the frequency vector omega, where the gap omega dot n is actually uh, lower bounded by some power law in, as, as a function of n. Uh, so here m is the number of tones of the drive. So for example, the uh, two frequencies like one and the golden ratio would satisfy this diophantine condition. It turns out that pretty much all choices of, of, frequency, vec of, of, of frequency vectors obey this diophantine condition. And here, when I mean almost all, I literally mean it in the measure theoretic sense, almost all, but a measure set of uh, vanishingly small set of uh, frequency vectors do not obey this. And so what this is telling us is that even though there can be small gaps, uh, there can be small, small energy differences, you need to find a very large n before you can you know, achieve such a small gap. And now if you also additionally impose that the driving is smooth or analytic, you know, without any sharp discontinuities, then the full remotes, which are the ones that affect the, the, the transitions, will be decaying quickly in N. So this will save the day because this sets the time scale or the, the amplitude by which a large N process can, can affect a transition. So all in all, if you, if you combine all these three um, conditions, you would get a stretched exponentially suppressed heating rate, you know, which is also a very long time. Um, so M here, one, once again, I remind you is the number of tones of the, of the quasi-periodic Hamiltonian. So um, what we have then is that we can update our diagram. So going back to this diagram is that the system actually takes a very long time before it goes to the infinite temperature fixed point. But we want a bit more than this. We want to understand what does it actually go towards besides the fact that it doesn't heat up in, in time. So one way to do this is to construct an effective generator of the many body dynamics. And uh, I guess this is pretty well known. So that, that this, um, you know, you can in a high frequency limit, you can construct uh, an effective static Hamiltonian that governs dynamics for long times. And this one, one incarnation of this is the Magnus expansion, which is, as I mentioned, a high frequency expansion. But I'd like to comment that, you know, this expansion cannot generically converge, right? Because, you know, you can you can construct this expansion to add infinitum, but if it were to converge it would mean that H effective is a conserved quantity. And this would not square with, square with the fact that the late time behavior, we expect it to be an infinite temperature ensemble with no conserved quantities. So at some point, this expansion must not converge. And so there's a question, what order should we take it to? And uh, a bit more worryingly, you know, this is an expansion only for flow case systems. And I mentioned that I also want to look at quasi periodic systems. So this somehow does not, um, immediately translate to the quasi particle driven systems. So in the next few slides, I will, I will derive for you um, a, a different set of high frequency expansions uh, to obtain effective generators of many body dynamics. 
And I also want to argue that this expansion, the current expansion hides some interesting mathematical structure that would be important to understand new phase structure in the dynamics of driven systems. Okay, so as a warm up, uh, well, before I get to the warm up, I'd like to say uh, a few more comments about why we can treat Floquet and quasi periodic as on equal footing. So, one way of looking at the Floquet system is that we have a Hamiltonian H of theta, which is defined on a circle. And then I'm just going to move along the circle and evaluate the argument as a function of time by choosing some frequency vector omega. So a Floquet Hamiltonian would be just would, would just be a Hamiltonian evaluated on, on a circle with, with omega t, and then you, you identify the two ends. So, so because the circle can also be thought of as a line with, with the two ends identified, 0 to 2 pi, so we, we can think of this as a linear flow on a flat compact manifold. Now a, a quasi periodic system is really not much of a difference. The, the generalization of a sphere in higher dimensions is just a torus, S1 cross S1, or S1 cross many times. And all we have to do is choose a direction that we move in. So we choose a frequency vector, and then we start winding around the torus in different fashions. So this would define a quasi-periodic Hamiltonian via this relation. We choose a direction we move from the torus and evaluate it, and this gives us the time-dependent Hamiltonian. Uh, this is an abuse of notation, but never mind this. So equivalently, because the torus can be unraveled into a flat space with the two ends identified, or two sides identified, this is just moving on a flat surface again, a flow on a flat surface. And so, so therefore, this allows us to, to talk about Floquet and quasi-periodic on equal footing. And um, from now on, I'm just going to drop the vector notation and just refer to H of theta. Uh, Venve, uh, just a second. Uh, so since there were many discussions, uh, we can prolong a bit the talk. So you have 15 more minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So the, the next uh, few slides will be about deriving the effective generator of dynamics. And I'm sure, you know, this, this is not, uh, this is something that's familiar. Like for example, um, if you have a Kapitza inverted pendulum where you're driving the pivot with high frequencies nu and the pivot and the pendulum itself is a natural frequency omega zero, what we can always do is we can uh, treat, we, we can separate the variable of interest into slow and fast variables and then derive an equ equation of motion for the slow variables, integrating out the fast variables and finding that the slow variables obey some effective potential like this. And so that's the main aim that I will try to also utilize or the main idea I'll try to utilize in in the quantum many-body Hamiltonian setting. So the key idea is to split the fast and slow modes. So I'll introduce a frame change, which is affected by some Hermitian operator A of theta, so that the unitary, the full unitary, is decomposed into two parts. One, a fast part, and one, a slow part. And this is uh, colloquially what is known as a micro motion. In this new frame, the Hamiltonian of the slow degrees of freedom is then defined by this relation. So all, we, all, we, all we're doing is conjugating it by the, by the frame change. And because the frame change is time dependent, there's a gauge potential that arises from the time dependent change. And now if we look at what this Hamiltonian is, we can split it into two parts, into a time dependent, independent and time dependent part, which is defined you know, via the two relations. And now, if we expand this expression uh, using, you know, the if we just expand it, you know, uh, the, the exponential uh, in terms of all the commutators, we will find that to leading order, um, there will be a um, a part which goes as the derivative of a of theta, and so on and so forth. And so, so the aim now is that we want to to uh, choose our frame change so that we eliminate any time dependence of the Hamiltonian and make it more and more time independent. And that's what will set the dynamics of the slow variables. So once again, the um, condition to satisfy it is that we are going to choose the generator A to always, at this step, eliminate the time dependent pieces of the original Hamiltonian. And then we can iterate the entire process and, and, and therefore make the Hamiltonian more and more time independent. OK. So the, the key point I want to just raise is that this, is, this relation that we have to solve is a first order differential equation. So there are many solutions to this and requires a boundary condition. 
So if I choose, for example, a boundary condition where A of zero is zero, this ends up becoming the Magnus expansion in flow K systems. And you can also understand this as the generalization of the Magnus expansion in quasi periodically driven systems. But what I want to argue for is that um, there's another choice which I prefer and actually would uh, give rise to a lot more physics, which is that if you assume that the generator does not have any um, time, it, is, it, it does not have any time uh, dependence. So sorry, it doesn't have any time average over the entire manifold. So this is what is known as a Van Vleck expansion. And th these are just two different ways of decomposing the of the entire time uh, evolution operator. Um, both involve a micro motion and the slow variables. In this case, the Van Vleck um, Hamiltonian would be given by um, this, the, the Hamiltonian generating dynamics for this U of uh, Van Vleck would be given by this expression. And there's always some remnant time-dependent piece. And the, the key point is that we want to argue for how small this piece can be. And this was done in, the, in these works, uh, in, in some of my works, uh, for one in full case systems and one in quasi particle driven systems, where it was shown that this uh, extra time-dependent quantity can be uh, made optimally small, that is uh, actually sm much smaller than any polynomial in, in the frequency omega. And so to a very good effect, we can simply ignore this delta V term and just assume that dyna dynamics is just generated by a time independent Hamiltonian uh, given by the blue expression. So let me just state it again. Um, the effective description of dynamics is that we can treat the time evolution operator as just composed of two parts, slow, fast variables and slow variables. And the slow variables is just given by some effective Hamiltonian effective static Hamiltonian with some expansion, uh, which is a high frequency expansion. And this lasts for a long time. And therefore this gives us, gives us a, an answer to what the uh, phase space structure can be. For most purposes, we can drop the fast variables because they're not really important. And therefore we can say to a great, uh, to a good degree of um, accuracy that dynamics is more or less just generated by a time independent Hamiltonian. So the, the updated figure would be this, that the, the initial state eventually reaches infinite temperature, but in between is pulled towards a non-equilibrium fixed point given by H effective. And because H effective generates also time dynamics, it's conserved in dynamics. And so the equilibrium state is, 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 um, is defined by, by the, the conserved energy with respect to H effective. So there's some temperature beta that each effective would, would pull it towards. And this description lasts for a long time. And this is what is known as vanilla high frequency pre thermalization in flow case systems, which has been you know, uh, seen experimentally in Emmanuel Bloch's group and also Paula Capillaro's group in MIT. Okay, now I will try to get to the, the new parts, more exciting parts, which is that um, besides, uh, having, besides there being an effective Hamiltonian, so suppose that the driving Hamiltonian has an additional structure, which is called a twisted time translation symmetry. So uh, let me go a bit slow so that everyone understands here. What this is saying is that, you know, if I look at a Hamiltonian at one argument in uh, one point in his argument, it is related to a Hamiltonian at another point in his argument up to the action of a unitary G. So suppose that there is this relation, the examples would be this, if I have a Floquet system, what I'm trying to say is that the Hamiltonian here at point zero is related to the Hamiltonian here at say point uh, pi up to the action of G. And because you must close under this relation, that means that G is actually the um, a generator of the Z2 symmetry, a uh, Z2 group, Z, G squares to one. A more exotic example will be say a quasi periodically driven system where the, the Hamiltonian here is equal to the Hamiltonian here up to the action of G. And then if you iterate the process is up is equal to, to the Hamiltonian here up to G again, and once again, uh, equal to this Hamiltonian up to G and therefore G, G has a cube to one. And so G is the, um, the generator of a Z3 group in this case. And it's not just for the, these points, it's also for any point here. So here must be equal to a point here, must be equal to a point here. So basically this, suppose that we have such a special Hamiltonian. 
Now the key point I want to make is that if it has this additional relation, then it turns out that the effective Hamiltonian that you derive in the Van Vleck expansion has that, that symmetry G. And one way of seeing it is that you can go into Fourier space. This, this relation just translates to a relation on the Fourier modes, H of n, where upon conjugation by G, it just picks up a phase factor. And so if you stare at the expansion of this effective Hamiltonian, you find that all the phase factors vanish as you conjugate between G, dagger, and G. And therefore, this means that the effective Hamiltonian possesses somehow a microscopic symmetry G. And you can promote this to multiple time transition symmetries, uh, multiple twisted time transition symmetries, GI, because it doesn't only have to be one relation, you can have many of them. And what this means is that the effective Hamiltonian possibly has multiple Zn1 cross Zn2 cross Znm symmetries. And if this is so, then we have a... Possibly. Sorry, why possibly? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so if it has this relation, then it will have the symmetries. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. So then we can, we can now update our, our diagram and say that you know, there are cases where if it has this twisted time transition symmetry, you would perhaps uh, see the two symmetry wells, for example, if there's a Z2 symmetry and the system spontaneously breaks it, for example. But this actually leads us to new phases because um, you, one may ask, this twisted tr time transition symmetry seems quite artificial. This is a condition that you've posed. But now let me argue that actually occurs very naturally in a large class of physical systems. I'll give a, a specific example. And this would be that of a strongly driven quantum icing spin. So here I've just given icing interactions, Zeeman field, and some transverse field that is being periodically driven. But additionally, there's a transverse field that is uh, being applied, which has large amplitude, which scales with frequency, omega. And in this, in, the, in this current formulation, you cannot take the high frequency limit because the frequency of the drive omega is comparable to the amplitude of the terms here. Because in order to take the high frequency limit, we have to ensure that omega is always much larger than any of the local couplings. To, to rectify this, what we can of course do is that go, we can of course go into the, the, into the interaction frame of a strong drive, you know, so pull, uh, de define this unitary and then define the interaction Hamiltonian in this, in this new rotating frame. And what then happens is that all couplings become um, small compared to omega because J1s and J2s are all, you know, in, the, in front of the terms, but all the uh, large terms are all in oscillating factors. What's amazing is that the interaction Hamiltonian now actually has a twisted time transition symmetry. And in this case, what this twisted time transition symmetry is, uh, is this operator X, which is the global spin flip on all the quantum spins. And so if you construct the effective Hamiltonian from the interaction frame Hamiltonian, then the effective Hamiltonian has a symmetry X, which is a spin flip symmetry. And the two points to be, to be made here one is that this example shows that the high frequency limit need not be realized only in the lab frame. You can, of course, go into some rotating frame before you take it. And that secondly, that this property of the effective Hamiltonian is a robust property. Why is it robust? Because I could add in anything I want here, you know, some any V I want, and you can do the same trick and you find that all of these relations still hold. So whatever you do to it, it will always have this emergent symmetry. And now this will enable us to find actually a new phase of, of, of matter, which is a pre-thermal time crystal. Okay, so let's concentrate on this unitary time evolution operator. It now has two parts, right? One is the uh, interaction frame change that I need to go into before I could derive the effective Hamiltonian. Assume that the effective Hamiltonian has a Z2 symmetry and therefore it has two different symmetry wells, sorry, two different symmetry wells. But because there is this this envelope in front of it, what this does is that it periodically flips u between symmetry well one and symmetry well two, because if you evaluate it at time, uh, at, 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 at a period of the drive, big T, it evaluates the spin flip operator. And so the system will start to go between the two symmetry wells and you know, tunnel between them. And this process persists for a super polynomially long time 
before eventually uh, reaching thermal equilibrium. So this, this is uh, denoted by these features here. And I should mention that these features are robust, robust because I said I could add in perturbations to the Hamiltonian and the, the, this would not change the behavior of it. And furthermore, furthermore they are long-lived. And this gives rise to what is known as a phase of matter, which is a pre-thermal time crystal. And this is one incarnation of the time crystal idea that was put forth by Frank Lucek. And um, you know, in all my talk, I presented to you just cartoons and, and equations, but now let me present some numerical data, which is you know, not mine, but from Norman Ziao's group, where they actually simulated in, uh, in a quantum icing model, exactly this protocol that I, I mentioned, maybe in a few extra details like long range interactions. But essentially the, the phenomenology is seen where you know, at the largest frequency, omega 22, let's say, that the magnetization goes between uh, plus one and minus one at, for even periods and odd periods. So this, this is a confirmation of this, this prediction. And um, now you could also have something a bit more exotic where if you now turn to quasi-periodic systems, you, you, didn't, you need not only have Z2 symmetries, the effective Hamiltonian could have exotic uh, symmetries like Z2 cross Z2 symmetries, in which case you would have four symmetry wells and suppose the system spontaneously breaks the uh, like th these symmetries, then you could have behavior where it goes between the different symmetry wells be before escaping. And this is the this is the essence of what is known as a pre-thermal time quasi-crystal. And we we, did, we gave some conditions for this and also some examples in spin chains in this PRX work. Okay, so um, in the very last part of the talk, yeah, I think I'm running a bit late, but now let me switch. Yeah, perhaps to, two yeah. minutes. Okay, so two minutes. Okay, so let me say that pre also occurs not just at high frequencies, but at low frequencies. So here's one particular class of systems in which you can have pre occurring. Um, it's still a Fouquet system. You're driving it at some frequency omega, and it has local interactions J, but there's a spe special structure to it where there's a term uh, where there's a large amplitude nu coupled to an operator N, where N has uniform spectral gaps. For example, this could be the Zeeman field. And what I'll argue for is that this operator actually happens to be uh, conserved in dynamics, even though, even though uh, energy need not be, because frequency could be low in this case. Okay, so, and, and, and to give a flavor of the intuition, let me just say that, um, for example, you could take, you, you can understand why this is so, uh, you, you know, you, you can look at the energy eigenstates of N and you can, you can color code them. Like these are different sectors well separated by this quantity nu. And you could ask what are the transitions that move you outside of one, one sector of N. And that the two processes, the Hamiltonian could, you know, in a time independent fashion, tunnel you between these two regimes, uh, these two sectors, but this is very suppressed because of the large energy gap. Conversely, it can absorb, it can absorb or emit photons so that this, pro this energy level is more or less resonant with this energy level and then transition between two of them. But this requires a Fourier mode, which has you know, large Fourier number. And so if we impose that we have a smooth drive and this energy hierarchy, then we will get that N is approximately conserved for long times. And um, I'll skip this, but let me just say that es essentially, there can still be pre-thermal phases of matter that appear in such a scenario. For example, if we take the domain wall operator N, which is, which is uh, in higher, higher than two dimensions, the system can get trapped near one of the symmetry wells. And if not, it thermalizes to late times. And this happens without the concept of energy, without the concept of temperature. And this is why we call pre-thermalization uh, pre without temperature or energy in this case. So I know the last part is a bit quick, but uh, you know, if you want to learn more about it, please feel free to ask me about it. All right, to summarize, let me just say that um, pre thermalization offers a route towards stabilizing symmetries and realizing non-trivial dynamical responses, even if the system does eventually thermalize. And this can lead to new phases of matter like you know, time quasi-crystals and time crystals. And so there are many interesting open questions here, like you know, uh, some immediate ones are relaxing the technical assumptions, smoothness of drives. But I think more interestingly, I, I want to ask, can there be pre-thermalization scenarios beyond the Fouquet and quasi periodic drives that we have, we have uh, looked at? Are there other dynamical protocols 
They can stabilize more exotic symmetries, thereby leading to more non-equilibrium phases of matter. And I think this is a very interesting direction that you know, everyone's pursuing right now. And uh, I think many more results will definitely come in the future. So thank you for your time. And I also thank my collaborators. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Venvey. Um, let's thank our speaker for this uh, great talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we have time for a few short, shorter, let's say, questions. Um, if there are any, uh, please raise hands. Um, in the meantime, let me start maybe. Um, you, uh, you also uh, put here uh, open question. So uh, can you say uh, about relaxing this smoothness? So what about kicked system to go to kind of the other extreme? Is there any work or? Right. Um, so as far as I know, um, no, I, I don't know of any works that have proven strong statements in kicked systems. Um, in flow case systems, this does not really matter so much because, um, because even in a kick system, you still, like, like, like the way to think about it is that if you decompose the driving protocol in Fourier remotes, like the energy absorption is still in multiples of omega, which is big, right? So there's a large yeah. gap that prevents you from, from absorbing that photon. So kicks or no kicks or smooth drives in flow case does not really matter, but it seems that it matters in quasi periodically driven systems because uh, the logic is that now you can potentially absorb a, a large, uh, uh, sorry, you can, you, you, can, you can affect the transition uh, and this transition can be quick if you have a long range decaying Fourier modes, right? So there, there the kick really matters. And maybe there's a way to get out of this. Uh, I think there's some, some new directions that we have to explore, but it seems to us that uh, in the worst case scenario, the, the heating rate should then become a power law in the drive frequency, not a stretch exponential in the, in the drive frequency. Mm -hmm. For the quasi-periodic. Yeah, quasi-periodic, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and also the last part of the talk, which I didn't have time to really go through. But for now, let's just say in quasi-periodic, the, the nature, the shape of the drive would seems to play an important role in determining the heating rate on the systems. Okay, thank you. Um, any... uh, may I ask a question? Uh, um, yes. Right. So uh, first, uh, there is this quantum kick rotor, which is uh, uh, probably not a quantum anybody system uh, in in your in your setting. But still, how would you comment maybe uh, on on that? It is a driven. It is a kick system, and uh, as opposed to its classical uh, variant, it doesn't show uh, in some sense. Uh, overheating or uh, and shows actually dynamical localization. Um, yeah, so so in that case, uh, I mean, I, I guess the crucial difference is that um, here I'm thinking of the fact that the energy levels eventually become uh, exponentially dense in the system size, you know, a, a true many body system, and, and that's what gives rise to all this. Uh, right. heat, heating and, and, and equilibration. Yeah, so I, I, if, if you move away from that limit, then you can definitely see uh, phenomenology beyond just textbook criminalization. And another uh, very rhetorical maybe question is, uh, if you very formally take uh, a time-dependent Hamiltonian, yes. uh, in a, um, uh, uh, how should I say, in a, in a classical setting, so using uh, uh, Poisson brackets, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, you can always uh, uh, extend the phase space of the system by uh, adding, if you wish, one additional degree of freedom or or two two additional dimensions, uh, such that you get to a new Hamiltonian, which is uh, which is time independent. Of course, you pay for that uh, because uh, you get. Uh, you, you lose uh, properties like grounds, uh, having a ground state, uh, minimum energy, and things like that. But can you maybe just briefly comment on that? So, uh, how is what if I try to do something similar in a quantum setting? Does it make any sense, or where do things uh, break down? 
if I think along these lines. Oh, so I think it actually does not break down. The, the same um, ideas also apply to quantum Hamiltonian because ultimately it's a statement about Floquet theory. So Floquet theory is just saying that um, you, can, you can, of course, write down a time independent Hamiltonian on a larger space, right? And, and, that, and, and then you can do the evolution in that larger space and project back into your physical space. And that, that, that becomes a time independent, a time dependent Hamiltonian. And, and this also still applies and, and this also still applies in the quantum case and people have used such um, analogy to uh, understand the say properties of, of non-interacting fermions because there, there you can really think of it as fermion, the, say, say a, a fermionic chain um, or fermionic systems, non-interacting, non, non then you can, you can extend them to higher dimensions and understand that there are topological properties from, from such a point of view. But for the, for the many body case, it's, it's a bit hard because even though this mapping works formally, um, you lose a sense of locality. We, a, a strong condition in all, this, all the results I'm presenting here is the idea of spatial locality. So now if you try to do it for a, an interacting many-body system, you can of course write it down, but it's very hard to make statements about how energy is transported across the extra dimension because extra dimension will no longer be, be very local. But you could, in principle, also do this for then uh, for a system, a driven system, which is neither periodic nor quasi-periodic. Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, so, okay, so mathematically, I know of cases where you can do it, um, but it, but they, they require you to really generalize, like generalize this idea of the, this flow. Okay, so here, here I've presented to you um, that Floquet and quasi-periodic can be understand, understood as a flow on some compact manifold. And this will allow you to say that actually there is a time independent Hamiltonian on the larger space. Now, now you, if you assign to this manifold extra Hilbert spaces, then you can define a time independent Hamiltonian. So the, the extra, the, the, the classes beyond Floquet and, and quasi-periodic would involve finding manifolds and flows on them, then you can, you can do this mapping again. But gen oh, well, uh, generally, me, generally speaking, I don't think you can do that. Yes. Uh, well, I don't see that right now because the thing I had in mind uh, uh, is uh, written down in a general form without knowing what the... So basically you just take time T and, uh, or you call it tau simply, uh, and then you add to your Hamiltonian one additional, I guess one kind of action or something like this. And then this uh, tau and the action uh, form another canonically conjugated pair of variables, and and that's it. And so uh, it is always I always add only two uh, dimensions to my phase space, no matter what the no matter what the type of the what, what the time dependent specifically is. I see. Quasi it's a bit mm. different. It, it seems you try to argue here that. If you go quasi periodic, you you increase the uh, dimension of well, yeah, sure you increase the dimension of uh, of your space. This I understand, but uh, the, okay, I think I have to. Maybe we can discuss later. Yeah, we, we can discuss it later. Yeah, I I'll be interested to to know more about this mapping as well. Okay, we have uh, another question from Alexei. Please, Alexei, unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, thanks. Actually, I have three questions. Uh, sure. One, is, I'm curious. So these phases, I mean, sorry, the phases you were looking at, eventually at infinite times, they um, they uh, they disappear and just the system just heats up to infinite temperature. So is there a way to stabilize them so that they become really an infinite time uh, phases? Right. So that's a great question. Um, of course, uh, one way of doing that is to say, invoke many body localization. Then you could, of course, uh, people have uh, discussed time crystals in a many body localized sense, which are infinite yeah, time no, no, phases. Right. So that yeah. I understand, sorry, I'll perhaps make my question a bit more precise. I mean, my question is really, I can imagine that if you start with a system where ergodicity is broken, then uh, perhaps, ah, but I'm right. curious now, now if you take one of the systems where these phases, I mean, they um, persist for long times, but mm -hmm. on finite, 
And now I ask a question, so can I modify that system so that that particular phase becomes stable? So is, is that always possible or? Right, no? I think that uh, that's a great question. And I believe that there's been some discussion about say adding a small, a weakly coupled bath that would dissipate the, the entropy generated locally. Mm. That, that would stabilize the scenario. But I don't think anyone has like thoroughly explored exactly how or when this happens. So the, so the key idea is that you know you want to prevent the entanglement growth of the subregion A with the rest of the system. And so you need to continually remove this, its entropy. So perhaps by adding a, a bath to it, you can cool down the system at the same time it is undergoing this dynamics. OK. Yeah, so the second question is then you mentioned, uh, well, among the open questions, uh, the possible other possible phases. Some, well, as someone coming from a glass uh, community, I wonder is do you think it's possible to generate glasses? Because so far you were uh, looking at phases that were reasonably simple, so to say, like having Z2 symmetry or their combination. So, can you uh, do you think it's possible to cook up uh, glassy systems this way? To cook up glassy systems this way. Um, so, so te what te yeah, I think I think technically, if I understood correctly, that would correspond to instead of having say two minima in the landscape, having a lot and organized in hierarchical way. That would be yeah. a very simplified view. Right. So I don't think I can comment uh, very intellig intelligibly, but I can say that. <clears throat> You know, you, you can realize multiple symmetries in these systems, and I'm not sure if that's sufficient to give you this glossy systems that you uh, that you like to think about. Um, but well, I would rather think. I mean, I'm uh, at this point. I don't know the answer because I really I don't think in in standard glasses you have symmetries, but perhaps frustration might be a way to go. So if if there's if there's way to generate. Uh, to get frustrated effective Hamiltonians out of perhaps non-frustrated ones, that mm. would be a way. Right. I see. Well, anyway, this I, I was just curious. Let's put it this way. I was just curious if there's an immediate uh, no-go uh, theorem that says no, you cannot. And I see. No, I I think it's more like I I don't know. I I don't know whether. Okay. Or not you can do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. And so then the third question is uh, pretty simple. So the protocols. So we mentioned well. Um, if you ask me about driven systems, I could think of like the standard plaque. So you just have one tone, quasi periodic. Yes. If I want to invent something beyond that, uh, at least to me, the, the next thing that comes in mind is when um, your uh, driving becomes, well, completely random. Mm -hmm. well, this probably starts sounding like kicks, but I probably can imagine something smooth, but where you don't have even quasi periodicity, but some sort of randomness. So yeah. does it make sense? And if it does, uh, what, what, what are your expectations? I mean, as a drive, it definitely makes sense. I mean, um, one of the beauties about driven systems is that if you can write down any you know, function in time, you can pretty much employ it in the quantum simulator and just drive the system and see what happens. But from a heating point of view, uh, from a heating point of view, because if you have a random drive, then you will have a whole spectrum of frequencies. Uh, they'll not be very structured, unlike Floquet or quasi-periodic. And one of the main challenges you have to fight would then be the heating. And like, why would, would the system not simply just end up in uh, the infinite temperature state right away? So that's one of the main challenges I think would be faced in uh, if one were to do just random, let's say, Brownian noise heating. Yeah. Because, because you, you see, it's, it has to do with the power spectrum of your drive as well, right? So yeah. what, what I try to argue for here is that the um, in, in quasi-periodic, even though the spectrum, the power spectrum of the quasi-periodic Hamiltonian is, is dense, you know, it, fi it fills the entire real line, it actually has a lot of structure because of the diophantine condition. Where else in a random a random drive then if it's I mean, for, for, for a random right? drive the question is basically can you uh, can you again uh, is there a constraint that would prevent the system from just quickly heating up exactly yeah I, I and I don't know that so on, on one hand my intuition is that it heats up quickly on the other hand maybe it it gets kicked around so quickly that 
things average out, so maybe it's fine. But well, really I, I, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess the, the answer is really that you probably might need to do some fine tuning to uh, possibly yes to avoid the heating. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. No, thank you. Okay, um, I see no further raised hands. So um, I would like to thank uh, thank uh, Venway uh, again. Uh, so let's thank our speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, I suggest now that we uh, close the seminar session, uh, but um, people that are interested in discussing, uh, maybe we can meet after five minutes, a short break uh, to get some coffee. Uh, okay, sure. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you okay. all. And thank you, thank so you I'll, Venve. I'll just rejoin uh, this link. Uh, you can stay online. Just, stay online. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just, just, uh, and, and, and stop the video so we don't see what you are doing there and then come back in five minutes or so. That's what okay. I will do. See you later. I see. All right. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>